Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of what I expect is going to be a very long series. The story-by-story -story reviews of every single story from the classic series of Doctor Who, from an unearthly child all the way up to the 1996 TV movie. That's what we're going to be doing. So I'm envisioning this as being a bi-weekly series. So every other week I'll do one of these. And then in between it'll be other Doctor Who stuff. Uh, at the moment I'm doing videos about the comics, for example. Um, yeah. So let us begin with the very first story ever. Both the novel and the televised version of An Unearthly Child. Today on Timey Wimey Tuesday on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Okay, so for these story-by-story -story reviews, um, for those of you who haven't seen sort of the lead-up videos to these, I'm basically going as in-depth as I possibly can as far as my viewing experience goes and experiencing the stories to kind of give you, you know, not only my thoughts on the stories, but also reviews of the DVDs themselves and also talk about the Target books and see how they differ, if at all. So, first thing I did was I read the Target book then I watched the original pilot version, then I watched the alternate version of the original pilot version, and then finally I watched the four-part televised version. So, I guess we'll start with the story itself, An Unearthly Child. So Doctor Who originally premiered on November 23rd of 1963, and it had a um, bit of an uphill battle getting on the screen in the first place. The series had already been already been greenlit, essentially for an entire year's worth of episodes, as the, the brainchild of Sidney Newman, head of drama at the BBC at the time, uh, had a brand spanking new producer in the form of Verity Lambert, uh, the first female producer that the BBC had ever had. Prior to that, it was kind of a lot of stuffed shirt old white guys. She had an uphill battle just to be heard. I should mention one of the things I rewatched also as uh, part of this was An Adventure in Space and Time, which I've talked about before, and I cannot recommend this movie highly enough. It takes a little bit of creative license here and there with some of the events, but for the most part, pretty darn historically accurate. A very loving uh, look at the creation of the series. Another resource that I'm using for these, uh, just to get a little bit more behind the scenes insight, is this wonderful book by Peter Haining, Doctor Who, The Key to Time. Now this was kind of a follow-up to the book he did the previous year, Doctor Who, A Celebration, which was for the 20th anniversary. This book is really interesting, though, because it's actually done... Uh, let see if I can show you here. It's actually done in uh, more or less a... like a diary style that actually gives you, uh, not a daily account, but, you know, significant dates in the history of the production of the series and all kinds of cool behind-the-scenes insights. So, needless to say, there's quite a lot about the, uh, the first story here, you know, one of which is the fact that the pilot, of course, did not screen very well with Sydney and the, uh, the other higher-ups. Actually, we call it a pilot, but it's not really a pilot because... What a pilot episode is, is kind of a, a first-run episode that you use as your pitch to the network to get the green light to do the series. In this case, the series had already, already been greenlit, so it wasn't a pilot, it was the first episode. And they screened it, and there was various issues that Sidney Newman and, uh, and some others had, and even Verity Lambert and uh, the director, Waris Hussein, uh, felt that it could be better. So Sidney Newman uh, doing what was rarely done in those days, given the, the, the very limited budgets for television shows, gave the go-ahead to redo the first episode. So they remounted, and a few days later, they reshot the entire thing. Now, back then, the shows were done almost like a live stage play. Editing was very expensive and very uh, time-consuming, so they were only allowed like three or four edits per show. 
So for the most part, it had to be done live right there in one long take with all the vision mixing being done live between the multiple cameras on the studio. So it could be very hectic. <laughs> and the actors really had to be on the ball and know the material. And given that it was going out weekly and they were doing, I mean, the plan was to do 52 episodes a year, like one every single week. That didn't give them a lot of time to learn the lines, to rehearse, to prepare and so forth. So big kudos to all of the crew during those days. Uh, I, I just can't imagine what a madhouse it must have been just trying to get a single episode done of that show. So the original pilot version, which is just what we call it now, not everybody knows this, I don't think, but there was actually another retake as well done the same day that the first version was done. There's basically two halves to the story. There's the first half, which follows primarily Ian and Barbara sort of talking about Susan and the mystery surrounding her. Who is she? Why does she know so much about science and history and such? And the stuff at the school and things like that. That's the first half leading up to the junkyard. And then the second half is from the point where all the characters are inside the TARDIS. So that was uh, actually the only cut in the episode. Well, the only real, like, actual edit was the entry into the TARDIS. Well, I guess there was one more edit because there was also the exterior shot at the end of the first episode where you see the TARDIS on the primordial landscape and the shadow of the cavemen appearing. That was apparently done at a different studio because the, the Studio D that they were filming in just wasn't big enough to hold that set. <laughs> so they did it at a different studio just so they could have a more vast landscape. The vast majority of it was done in Studio D, all the school scenes and the junkyard scene and the TARDIS interior, all Studio D. So they did the first take of all the pre-TARDIS stuff, and then they did the first take in the TARDIS. The first take in the TARDIS was an unmitigated disaster. I mean, there was just so many things going wrong, and you see this. In, I mean, it's all captured on video. You can see it all in that version of the pilot. You know, the doors wouldn't close. They just kept, like, swinging open and banging on the wall. And there was a thing about Studio D where it was it was just a crappy little closet of a studio. I mean, A, there wasn't a lot of space. And B, the sprinklers were apparently overly sensitive and had a tendency to go off if the lighting got too hot. Uh, so it heated, heated up the studio too much. Uh, now, in... An adventure in space and time, they actually have the sprinklers go off when they're in the middle of filming the pilot episode. It's a hilarious moment. That didn't actually happen, uh, as far as I'm aware. When, uh, when that, I'm sure it happened at some point during the 50 or so episodes they did that year, but uh, uh, it didn't happen on the pilot episode. They just kind of threw that in as a bit of you know a bit of fun because uh, it is the, the kind of thing that that studio was known for. But yeah, there was there was definitely some problems. One of the big problems I had with it was the audio, was they had this, uh, you know, just crazy synthesizer, ethereal buzzing and, you know, spacey riff going on, which sounded like it was being done live in the studio, actually. I kind of pictured a guy on the side, like, adjusting the dials on his Moog synthesizer and or whatever he was using, you know, adjusting it for the scene. The problem is this sound, this background, sound is so loud like it almost drowns out the actors and it's really really distracting um, in the final televised version of that episode you hear just a, a smidgen of that when uh, the doctor lo locks the doors when Ian tries to get out and he kind of snickers you hear that sound and then it goes and it just kind of fades away like they just use a piece of it and that's i think much more appropriate and also in the televised version of the pilot we actually have the more familiar just kind of low-key tardis hum like the idle sound of the tardis which is much nicer and you know easier on the ears yeah and then there was some other things with the pilot version uh susan was in more of a kind of shiny space girl outfit whereas in the televised version she's in more of just a, a regular you know normal normal clothes there's also some other uh, things some dialogue was changed susan makes mention of being born in the 42nd century whereas in the televised version she says she's just from another time another world it's the more left more mysterious rather than being very specific like that uh this is actually brought up by caroline ford in one of the commentary tracks as she said how she, she was kind of sad that one of the things that was lost in the televised version from the pilot version was Susan's pride in the TARDIS. Like for example, if you watch how she describes the TARDIS to Ian and Barbara in the pilot, she holds her head high and proudly proclaims, 
The TARDIS can go anywhere in time and space. Of course, she performs it way better than I just did, but in the televised version, she just said, well, the TARDIS can go anywhere in time and space. She just says it very matter-of-factly. It's not sort of bursting with pride like it was in the first one. And uh, and she said that was one of the things she always regretted that was, was lost. I guess just generally there were other things that were lost with Susan in general. There was a lot of bold promises about what her character would be that never really came to fruition. For example, she was going to have uh, telepathic abilities, which was touched on in the Sensorites, but not really ever seen anywhere else ever. She was, of course, very intelligent, but uh, there was going to be a lot more sort of alienness to her character that uh, never really came to fruition, sadly. The other thing is in the school, actually, there's a, a couple of notable differences. The timing is just a little bit different for some of the dialogue. I mean, they, they, they tweaked that, obviously, in the, in the final version. Uh, but one of the big differences is when, um, after Susan talks with Ian and Barbara, they go off, and in the untelevised version, she does an ink blot and makes a pattern with like an like a Rorschach uh, ink blot and then draws something on it and then quickly crumples it up. Like uh, I, I got the impression it's supposed to be it's it's something that nobody in this time is supposed to know yet. So she doesn't want uh, anybody to see what she just did. In the televised version, however, she starts flipping through the book on the French Revolution that Barbara lent to her, and she turns to, like, page one, and she immediately goes, well, that's not right, which just adds to her mystery. I mean, both of those things add to the mystery, but I actually like the French Revolution version better, especially since later they actually go to the French Revolution, like, later in the same season, which is, uh, which is great. I guess they'd been there a few times, at least, uh at least once before. So yeah, as far as the pilot episode goes, they reshot the scene in the TARDIS one more time on the same day, and basically the same dialogue and the same things, just without all of the technical problems that the first take had, but still not quite right. I mean, it's still strange and unfamiliar, especially if you've mainly only seen the, the televised version. Now, if you want to see that pilot version, it is on the beginning DVD set. I will mention this, by the way. If you're looking to listen to the commentary track for the pilot version of the episode, there's a specific path you need to take to get to it. Now, first off, you have the episode selections, right? Now, normally, you can go into the special features, activate the audio commentary, and then go into the episode selection, pick your episode, and it'll play the commentary. Except for the pilot episode, because the pilot episode in the episode selection only plays the second take of the TARDIS interior shot, and not the, the, the previous even worse take. So <laughs> it just plays like, uh, you know, a nicely uh, complete version of the episode. Oh, there's actually one other shot that's in the, the full uncut pilot version, and that's a, a shot of Barbara running into the TARDIS. And they they just cut it right there and then redid it. I guess they just didn't like the way her entrance... It, was, it did seem a little too stumbly, I guess. So the way you want to get to the commentary is through the extras. So you go through the extras, activate the commentary, and then select the original uncut pilot episode from the extras. Then you'll get the commentary. And, uh, and it's a great commentary with, uh, with Verity Lambert and Morris Hussein, where they talk about all the various problems they had getting the, uh, the show going. And, uh, and it's really good stuff. So anyway, moving on, they were able to redo the episode in full, and the televised version plays much, much better. The, they had some tweaked dialogue. Uh, the other thing they changed a bit was the Doctor comes across as very abrasive in the original pilot version. They softened that considerably in the televised version. He still has that edge to him, but uh, a little bit more mischievousness rather than outright hostility, which I think is good. As they de describe it in An Adventure in Space and Time, William Hartnell was saying, well, where, where's the twinkle that you said the character has? Like, I'm not seeing the twinkle here. So you definitely see the twinkle, <laughs> as it were, in the uh, televised version. So finally, they had their first episode in the can, ready to go. Everybody was happy. And they televised it on November 23rd, 1963, which, as the luck of history would have it, was the day after President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So needless to say, the premiere of Doctor Who was kind of overshadowed by the news just a little bit that day. 
So Verity Lambert, being just the wonderfully tenacious person that she was, basically raised holy hell and said, you know what, our show needs a chance, you know? Our show needs a chance. Can we please have a rebroadcast? So the BBC reluctantly decided to rebroadcast the first episode on, I think it was November 30th, just before the second episode aired, so the people who had missed it the previous week would be able to catch it and give it a look. So a couple of unprecedented things, largely thanks to the tenacity of Verity Lambert and Sidney Newman. Sidney Newman knowing that he had something good here and it was worth giving a second chance and giving the go-ahead for the remounting of the pilot episode or the first episode. And Verity Lambert being tenacious and, uh, and getting us a repeat showing, which is great. So big kudos to both of them. 50 years ago. <laughs> so the first episode is a wonderful example of just, you know, low-key, character-driven science fiction. Uh, not a lot going on action-wise, but there's a lot of mystery and intrigue surrounding who is Susan, who is the Doctor, uh, what's, what's the deal with the TARDIS. It, it's wonderful. It's just so much fun. Now, a lot of people complain about the three episodes which followed. I am going to defend those three episodes because I think they are unfairly maligned. I am, of course, talking about their very first trip through time and space in which the TARDIS is sent hurtling backwards in time to the year zero, the dawn of man. Yes, they meet up a tri with a tribe of cavemen that are trying to uh, figure out the secret of fire. There you go. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Now, the thing is... I, I think it's unfairly maligned. I mean, a lot of people say, well, I could add something else, like maybe the Daleks or something. But no, I mean, the whole point of that first story was, was simply to, A, get the characters together in a plausible way, and B, show that the TARDIS does indeed travel through time. Uh, it can travel through space later. We'll deal with that in the second story, okay? But for now, we'll, we'll get the time travel aspect of it. So they go back in time to prehistory with the tribe of cave and trying to discover fire. And... I think it's wonderful. And, and and one of the reasons I think it's wonderful is because the actors are so committed to their characters. You know, the actors playing the cavemen do a fantastic job. You know, they really are convincing as this, this group of savage early humans just trying to survive out in the, the harsh world that is the dawn of man period of history. <laughs> And why, and why does it need to be anything more complicated than that? Because, I mean, what do we have in this situation? We have It shows that the TARDIS can travel through time. It establishes that the chameleon circuit is broken right off the bat because it's still a police box in the middle of this primordial landscape. And they make mention of that. A couple of the doctor mentions it and, and Susan mentions it. I should also mention in the, early in the second episode... Doctor Who is said twice. Yeah, Ian refers to refers to the Doctor as Doctor Foreman, assuming that he was the owner of that junkyard. I guess the I am Foreman junkyard, and uh, the Doctor says, "Hmm, Doctor Who? What are you talking about?" And then later, he's ta uh, Ian's talking to Barbara, and she refers to him as Doctor Foreman, and Ian says, "That's not his name. Who is he? Doctor Who." So that establishes the question, the question that is hiding in plain sight. It establishes it right off the bat. Uh, if there's any wonder about what the title means, why it's called Doctor Who, there you go. You have your answer twice in the second episode. If you miss it the first time, they have it again. So we have the establishment of the characters and their relationship and their dynamic. We have the establishment of the TARDIS and it being stuck as a police box. So you're going to see it as a police box in all these different places that it goes to throughout time and space. It will always be a police box. We have it established that it can travel through time. And then we have this situation that they get put into where they have to deal with these cavemen. A situation of extreme peril, danger, excitement having to escape, being chased, you know, it's got it all, man. And to me, that first story didn't need to be anything more complicated than that because it establishes everything that we need to know and gives us all the information that we need in that first story because it shows that time travel is not all fun and games. It can be very freaking dangerous. 
I mean, they almost all get killed right there on their first adventure. I mean, they're dealing with a bunch of savages. They're put in the cave of skulls where all the skulls are split open with, with stone axes. You know, these cavemen aren't messing around. You know, if you if you cross them the wrong way, they will kill you and, you know, leave you to rot in the cave without a second thought. The doctor even mentions it. He says, you know, can't you see there's no reasoning with these people? Their minds change like night and day. So as they sort of deal with the situation, they learn to turn that to their advantage and remove some of the more immediate dangers from the situation, such as the, the rivalry between Cal and Za for leadership of the tribe. Uh, I mean, Cal basically shoots himself in the foot by killing the old woman, but the way that the doctor brings the tribe together to rally against Cal is wonderful. And the, and the whole thing where he, he, he gets Cal to expose himself with uh, the whole knife. It's like, well, this knife has no blood on it. And he's like, well, this is a bad knife. It does not tell what it does. And uh, he says, no, no, that this is an excellent knife. This is this is the finest knife I've ever seen. So he's playing on there because he knows that, I mean, th these are very simple. They, they don't have logic and reason. They, they act primarily on instinct. And the doctor uses that to his advantage to turn the tide in the situation they're in and to turn the tribe over to their side. Uh, and try to alleviate some of the danger that they're in. And Cal is a loose cannon that needs to be dealt with. He is dangerous, you know. Za, at least, is trying to understand and learn things. Whereas Cal is just, he, he's an old school caveman. He's just pure savage. He just wants to lead the tribe because it's a position of power, you know, and that's that. And the doctor goes on to say, no, no, this is, this is a fine knife. This is the best knife I've ever seen. And he's like, oh, I'll, I'll show you a better knife. This is my knife. And, of course, his knife has the blood on it, and that, that exposes him as, as the killer. And I just love how that whole scene plays out, how it then turns to the, the doctor rallying the tribe to throw stones and cast Cal out. And then it ultimately culminates in the final confrontation between Cal and Zaw in the Cave of Skulls, where we, we have some pretty brutal moments in there, where uh, Zaw defeats Cal and then smashes his head in with a giant rock. You know, that's pretty pretty gruesome stuff for a kid's show. <laughs> of course, it all happens off screen, but we see the reactions of all the characters. Barbara like, looking away in horror, and the Doctor and Ian just, like, mortified. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty intense stuff. And then there's that other wonderful scene where they're, they're on the run. They've escaped. They're, they're trying to get back to the TARDIS. Za and her are following them through the forest. They're tracking them. Za gets attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. And then there's that moment where the doctor is stalking towards Cal with a rock in his hand, and Ian catches him and stops him and says, what do you, do, what do you think you're doing? He's like, ah, uh, uh, I was just going to get him to draw us a map. And it's like, no, you weren't. At this point, the doctor is all about self-preservation. You gotta remember, he's, he's an old man, but he's the young, brash doctor at the same time. It's an interesting juxtaposition. Of course, we don't really learn about that until later, but... But it, it fits when, when you look at it even in that context. He was going to kill Za because he was slowing them down. You know, simple as that. Uh, th there is no question that, that is what he was going to do. The doctor was going to kill the caveman uh, solely to save his own skin. But Ian, being the you know voice of reason, stopped him. Um, I gotta say, I just love the dynamic between the original TARDIS crew as well. Uh, Ian, the two-fisted science teacher. You got Barbara, the history teacher that occasionally tries to change history. You got Susan, uh, just really smart girl from the future. And then, of course, the Doctor, who is just full of mystery and uh, and knowledge and experience and uh, gentlemanliness when, when the occasion calls for it. Yeah, regarding the book, the book, for the most part, is a straight-up adaptation of An Unearthly Child. There's really not a ton that's been added to it. Uh, one thing I should mention, the scene with the saber-toothed tiger plays out a lot more gruesomely in the book than it does in the show. In the show, it's all kind of done with sound effects and implication. They don't actually show a saber-toothed tiger at any time because no money. That They made each episode of this serial for literally 2,000 pounds per episode and then the uh, the cost of the TARDIS set which obviously was going to be a standing set that would be reused cost like 18,000 pounds so uh, Verity Lambert being very clever suggested well we need this set so we'll aggregate the cost by uh, taking it out of the budget of you know several more episodes so just kind of 
amortize it over the course of several episodes which was a really clever idea, actually. Another thing I should mention, there's a, there's a passage at the beginning here that I thought was kind of funny because the book was written in 1981 by Terrence Dix from the script by Anthony Coburn. And um, if we go back here, uh, where is it here? Yeah, here it is, right at the beginning when the policeman is walking around he, he, in uh, uh, the original pilot version, he actually goes into the junkyard and looks around. In the televised version, he doesn't. He just kind of shines his torch on the door, and then he walks by. So in the book, he actually goes into the junkyard, and he's looking around. I just wanted to read this one little part to you here. He turned the torch beam on a square blue shape in the far corner and saw with some astonishment the familiar shape of a police box. At that time, police boxes were a common enough sight on the streets of London. Inside was a special telephone that police or even members of the public could use to summon help in an emergency. An odd thing to find in a junkyard, thought the policeman. Maybe this particular one had become worn out and been sold off for scrap. There were rumors that all police boxes would eventually be phased out, that one day every constable would carry his own personal walkie-talkie radio. That'll be the day, thought the policeman. Yeah, so I love that, that little glimpse into the future, because of course this is being written almost 20 years later. Uh, there's another section here that, that kind of stood out to me a little bit. Ah, here it is. Yeah, so they touch on this a little bit in the show, namely that uh, this is to do with Old Mother and why she chose to help uh, the uh, the TARDIS crew. And uh, they, they touch on it a little bit just through her dialogue, talking about how uh, Zaz's father, Gore, died. And she blames fire for the fact that he died. But really, that had nothing to do with it. And Za is trying to figure out the secret of fire, and his father never showed him before he died. So he's trying to figure it out from what he can remember from watching him make fire. So uh, just this little thing here I thought was just a, a slightly deeper insight into the thought process of Old Mother and why she was so dead set against them find, uh, making fire. So this little passage here just kind of stood out to me as a little bit of deeper insight into... Uh, why she thought that way. Only Old Mother was still awake. Fire leaped in her mind, too, but not as a savior, a protector. To Old Mother, fire was an evil demon. Her confused mind associated it with the death of her husband, Gore, and with all the misfortunes that had come upon the tribe. The strangers threatened to bring fire. The strangers were evil, too. Old Mother thought for a long time, wondering how she might save the tribe from the menace of fire. At last she thought of a way. She rose stealthily, creeping across the silent cave to the place where Za lay sleeping, her at his side. Za's precious knife lay close to his outstretched hand. The knife was a long, thin sliver of stone, its edge ground sharp. Old Mother reached out for it. Dun, dun, dun. Of course, uh, we think she's going to kill them, but she's actually going to set them free so that she won't, they won't bring fire. But I thought that was a nice little insight uh, into the thought process of, of Old Mother and sort of why, why she was so fearful of fire. Oh, one other thing I, I completely forgot to mention. When we first see the cavemen, we see Za trying to figure out how to make fire based on what he can remember watching his father. And... They have a little pile of twigs and ashes, and he's got uh, a stick in his hand, or I guess it was a bone, and he's ro rolling it in his hand. And I thought, what a nice little way to illustrate misunderstanding. So he saw his father probably rubbing a stick together or, or maybe doing something similar to what Ian did with the bow and that would turn the stick. So his father probably did something like that, and he saw it, but he didn't quite understand the mechanics of what he was seeing so he just saw that he was r moving his hands so he's trying to do it from memory so he's just got the the bone in his hands and he's rolling it and expecting it to just burst into fire he doesn't understand the 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 science of it you know obviously he's a, he's a caveman he just doesn't have that ability to understand but the fact that he he was being so like he was really like trying so hard you know and uh, was sure that that was the process. I mean, that to me was just, as I say, a wonderful illustration of misunderstanding 
through observation but lacking the the abil mental ability to process what he was seeing and going by memory and misremembering it and and just doing it completely wrong i mean that's that's, that's not gonna work buddy but there was a lot of little things like that and that's one of the reasons that always bugs me when i see people just talking smack about this it's like oh it's just a boring thing about caveman going ugh it's like no they don't i think the the only time any of them go ugh is to indicate understanding or displeasure at something. It's like, oh, I have to do this, and we go over here. Mm. You know? <laughs> you, you hear that a little bit when uh, Cal is talking, because, I mean, Cal is the more savage of the two uh, would-be leaders. Za, however, is, is quite articulate, and most of the other tribe are quite articulate, at least insofar as they're able to, to say what they're feeling and what they're thinking. Um, even though there there are other things that they don't understand, like when Barbara and Susan are trying to help Za, and her is all defensive, it's like, oh no, he's mine, don't touch him. And it's like I'm just trying to help, and it's like she doesn't understand. She's jealous of you. She doesn't understand things like compassion and friendship, and such. And and I just loved how the whole thing played out. How they, you know, at first they were all scared and you know frightened, and how are we going to get out of this situation? We're in so much danger. But they learned to work to. They very quickly learned to work together as a team, like the t the Tardis crew I'm talking about, and and to figure out a way to get out of the situation. And they, you know, you have Ian making fire and uh, and saying to Za, I said, uh, and Za is saying, I will watch what you do very closely. And Ian says, Well, the whole tribe should be watching. Everybody should know how to make fire. He's like, No, no, no. only the leader can make fire. So obviously he's not ready for that that step yet. But at least you know they can help get them on the road. And he says, well, who is, uh, you know, who is leader in your tribe? And it's like, well, he is, the old man. And he, and, uh, he says, well, what about the, the fire maker? And he says, well, the fire maker is the least important man in our tribe. And then the doctor cuts in and says, the fire maker is the least important because everyone in the tribe can make fire. So there you go. They at least plant the idea. And Zai even says it at one point. He says, I, I want to, you know, I want to talk to them more and hear more things that I need to remember, you know, which I thought was just a wonderful little bit of dialogue. The actor who plays Za, by the way, I don't know his name off the top of my head, but he appears uh, later in the series in season seven as one of the main characters in Inferno, actually. So it's quite interesting to see him not in caveman skins, but in, you know, fairly nice uh, outfit <laughs> but we'll talk about that probably a few years from now when we get up to inferno because there's a lot of stories during the first six seasons that we need to get through anyway overall really enjoy an unearthly child it was great to revisit it again um i have to say on the dvd uh just it, it looks and sounds as good as it's ever going to um, I think the only uh, film prints available were 16 millimeter prints. So the the vid fire processing that they used to give it the video look looks pretty good. Later episodes when they they used uh, you know better quality film stock for the uh, film recordings uh, definitely look better. Uh, these early ones are are a little rougher, but um, they definitely look and sound a lot cleaner than they did way back when I first saw them on PBS back in the day. Um, if you go and watch my very first uh, part of the Target Memories series that I did, where I talk about the Target books, um, I talk about the very first time I ever saw an unearthly child. So um, I've already told that story, which is why I decided not to repeat it here. So go watch that video if you want to hear that story. <laughs> Alrighty, well that is it for the first of the story by story reviews. I also highly recommend picking up this book, by the way. It's just a wonderful, uh, nice, concise resource at the making of the show. Now this is the 21st anniversary special. It covers 1963 up till 1983. Alrighty, so a quick thank you to my Patreon sponsors. Thanks, Patreon sponsors. You guys and gals are awesome. Uh, special big thanks to Kyle Pellegrin and Get Your Gorgeous On, my two highest level sponsors. And, uh, yeah, awesome. So we'll see you next time. Until then, thanks for watching, and sayonara.
Oh, I put it off all week. I'm just going to have to wing it. Just do it. Just do it! Today, on Timey Wimey Tuesday, on the Multimedia Chronicles. Forgot the name of my show for a second there. What the hell? Only been doing it for eight years. Uh, the, the, there's two halves to the story. There's the half, uh, prior to that, uh, bleh, bleh. and with all the misfortunes that had come upon the tribe. Bleh, 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 bleh. <clears throat> I'm going to read that again. <clears throat>